Hey everybody, uh, my name is Mike. Um, I want to talk about some stuff that has been on my mind for quite a while, things that I think need to be discussed for uh, a long time in our society. Um, uh, and the things I want to talk about are the police. Uh, I am, just so you know, I'm former law enforcement of 20 years, uh, still hold a reserve commission, uh, a little over 21 years in now. Um, and so over the years, I've kind of seen some things that um, and listen to people talk and, and stuff like that who really don't understand the police and what we do and why we do it uh, when we're on calls, when we're dealing with people, um, and when we're just dealing with the public in general. And so I think uh, what I've learned is that if people really kind of understood where we're coming from and, and the things we do, the things we're obligated to do, um, some of the things that we have discretion on, I think they would have, they would have a little bit better understanding and maybe a little bit more... Um, uh, empathy or respect, I guess you could say, for the police. Um, that's not to say that there aren't there aren't uh, officers who don't need to be in the profession. Uh, we get it, and to be honest with you, those type those type of people really kind of frustrate us frustrate us um, when we see them doing the wrong thing. Uh, they give us a black eye and, and everything else. So we get that, um, but there are a few things we want to talk about, and so. I'm going to go through my notes here as I'm talking about it. Um, I have a lot of typed up notes. I actually kind of title my notes uh, for the points that I'm trying to make or the points I want to discuss and stuff like that. Um, so if you have any questions about anything that we talk about, um, you can email me at whydothecops at gmail.com um, and I'll answer any emails that I can. Um, also, uh, check out our Facebook page at uh, just Facebook slash whydothecops. Um, and so you can, you can look at that there. I'll post videos of just different scenarios and situations and stuff like that. And, uh, just kind of get everybody's thoughts and opinions about anything. It's not a place for anybody to vent. So if, if that's what you're thinking about doing, um, those will get rejected. This isn't a place for that. This is a place to, to discuss, um, why we do what we do. Um, I get it. Not everybody is in agreement with the things the police do, but a lot of the times our hands are tied. Um, and we don't have a whole lot of options. So anyway, just follow us along. We're also on Twitter um, at Why Do The Cops. Um, and I'm trying to figure out this whole Instagram thing. So if you find me there, uh, just check it out, and we'll, we'll uh, see if we can make it work. But So I think a lot of times the police, uh, they seem unapproachable, um, and I get it. Um, they seem like they have attitudes and everything else, but... One thing I've seen in today's world is that everybody has attitude, um, especially especially just guys in general. Um, uh, there are some ladies that do as well, and and that and I get it. I uh, I think that's just part of the culture we live in. But there's this thing that we call cop culture, and so um, I think it's misunderstood. Um, I think people don't really understand where it comes from, but there are certain types out there uh, and that we need in society. To be honest with you. Um, Police officers are also uh, often misunderstood and considered to be arrogant douchebags um, because of the way they act uh, or the way they appear. Um, they don't seem like they're approachable and just disconnected from feelings or empathy from, for anybody. Um, from the way they present, to, uh, present themselves and the way they talk to other people, or even just because of the uniform they're wearing, the perception of police officers has manifested within the general society that is thought to be an intentional practice of those of us who wear the uniform, which it's it's not. Um, we do it for a reason. Um, but what if any of it? What if any of that stuff was not intentional? What if it's kind of who we are, uh, the DNA that we're made up of, uh, the habits that we put into daily practice, um, and just throughout our life, those habits uh, and practices are finely tuned to where we can put them into put them into a career and make them work for us. So those attitudes and, and the way we act, the way we talk and everything else uh, in law enforcement is called cop culture. So when you look at the actual definition of cop culture, it actually says a set of values that shape how police officers perceive their working environment and act within it. This worldview has shaped or is shaped by real and perceived dangers. That's very important right there, by the way. Um, real perceived dangers associated with police work and characterized by strong by a strong group introversion 
and cynicism towards non-police individuals or groups. So think about that for a second. That's what it's saying is people who are separate from, from law enforcement who kind of see how we act and the things that we do in our daily activities. Consequently, an us versus them mentality is created and reinforced uh, through officer selection, training, and work experience, which manifests its cynical attitudes towards the public and acceptance of misconduct and metaphorically known as the blue wall of silence. So that is the definition of cop culture. Um, I think some of it may be a little bit far stretched, um, uh, but it is what it is. So when we get to break it down a little bit more, um, it talks about values and stuff like that. It says uh, the regard and the definition, the Google definition of values, the regard that something is held to deserve the importance or worth or usefulness of something, the material or monetary worth of something. So for police, what this means is that they not only, is, is not, not only they, but the community they serve the people, building streets, property rights, laws of the Constitution, everything else, that has certain moral and social code uh, that they fall under, right? Uh, there is what we call a social, uh, a social code that we should follow for everybody. That's not just police officers. That is everybody has that responsibility when they're out in society. Um, that's how we act. It's how we treat other people. It's how we treat property. It's how we um, obey the laws and everything else. It's a social code that we are obligated to as, especially as adults and, and just people in general. Um, if, if we don't have a, a code to go by, then, then what are we, right? So now that everybody understands this, um, those who take the oath, they feel that they have a deeper sense of responsibility to those values and will go at great lengths to see that they are defended or adhered to at all costs, okay? Um, that's not to say they think they're better than anybody else. Uh, that's not to say that uh, they have a better understanding of some things. Um, it's just they're going to adhere uh, to those values. And again, yes, I know there are officers that that uh, that don't um, that have no business in the, in this profession, or at some point in their profession, uh, they decide that they're going to abandon those values. We get that, um, but there are uh, for the most of it, for the most part, we do uh, we do understand that and we accept that and we abide by that. Um, so a form of cop culture is developed at a certain point in a person's life, even before they sign up for the police academy. Some are raised in a family environment that has a lineage of military and or law enforcement. And this cop culture frames a mindset taught within the home and the family life. So um, it's, it's structure, it's, it's understanding and uh, they get it. It's, it's just something that they were that they were brought up in. Their their home life was was formed under these certain values. Um, not to say that nobody else's is, um, but they have a, a different understanding of things. That order must be upheld and must be kept um, uh, to to uphold that moral uh, societal code that we talk about. So um, for me, I can tell you right now. Um, that's not the way I was raised, uh, and, for, and for a lot of us that are, that are like that, um, that hold those values, we were raised to think differently. Um, matter of fact, we uh, uh, had family and friends, group of family and friends that were on the opposite side of the law. Um, just I think somewhere um, in our lives, uh, for those of us who weren't raised in that type of environment, uh, we realized that, hey, something's not right here, and we need to... Uh, we need to get on the on the path that is correct and, and do things where they should be done because what I'm being taught and what I'm being told is not is not uh, just it's going against the grain. It's making life harder. So somewhere along the line in our lives, we realize that and and we jump on board with this uh, with this mindset. Um, and so you see the mannerisms uh, of the children as they grow up that are brought up in this mindset. They're they're just very structured, uh, straightforward, very organized, uh, and whatnot. So um, the parents and other family members, they see, uh, they see the values and strictly are, their values are strictly passed on to their children. I'm sorry, I'm trying to read from my notes here. Um, I don't like reading from a script, uh, but to stay on point, this is what I'm doing here.
Equally as important as those who are brought up uh, to live by these beliefs and values, there are those who did not, just like what I talked about. Um, at some point in our lives, uh, these folks understand that there's a right way and a wrong way, uh, and we want to live, uh, we don't want to live the way that we grew up. Um, let's see, let's move on to page two here. We're just trying to get a better understanding, guys, of, of what the what the value and what the code is that we should live by. Not to say, like again, uh, like I said, not to say that nobody else doesn't live by this code. Um, it's it's one of those things that uh, as we become of age, we have an age of accountability, I guess you could say, that where, okay, now I'm starting to think like an adult and I'm starting to think responsibly and everything else. And so this is... This is how I chose to live my life, and so these are the, the standards of which I'm going to live by, and I, and I uh, believe in the law, and, and I'm going to enforce it, uh, and I'm going to join that group that does enforce it. So, um, very important. Um, so, my story and how I became into law enforcement um, was, I had no direction in life. I was in my early 20s. Um, my brother had gone through the police academy, and he had been talking to me about it. Um, at one point in time, and off and on, uh, actually several times, um, and I was just a knucklehead. I was uh, didn't have any direction, no purpose. Um, I skipped out on going to college. Actually, I didn't even graduate high school. But he was talking to me about it, and I'm like, "Hey, man, I don't want to be a fat cop. I don't want to eat donuts, and I don't want to be accused of eating donuts and all that other good stuff." So, um, but I was working in a convenience store at the time and I was uh, I was working in a, in a decent sized city and uh, I worked my store was in the hood <laughs> so um, every night my first year there I called the police every night for people stealing from me fights uh, just different things um, seeing dope deals go down in the parking lot uh, different things I found out in the parking lot and so I'm like, well, this is actually kind of interesting to me. Uh, I wonder, I want to know what the process is by which they, they handle these calls and stuff. So, um, but I'm working one night, about three o'clock in the morning. I've been sick, called my manager in, and he gets there about three o'clock in the morning. Um, he's cashing out the register and everything else. We're doing a changeover. Uh, and I'm, I'm halfway puking my brains out. But, uh, these couple shady looking dudes come in and they're standing or they, they actually stand outside the front door. I always kept one of the doors locked. Well, so these guys are standing there talking. And I'm just kind of watching while I see one of them reach down in his boot and pull something out and hand it to the other guy. Um, I look over at my manager. I'm like, hey, man, I think uh, something's about to happen here. I'm not sure what it is, but something's about to go down. And he just kind of he kind of blows it off like it's no big deal. Um, one of the guys took off running, uh, not to stereotype or, or put anybody in a box of any kind, but uh, his cat, he's wearing a black ball cap, uh, long black coat, black jeans, black t-shirt, and uh, black boots. I remember it like it was yesterday. This is the summer of 1997. Um, anyway, he takes off running down the sidewalk. Uh, all I know is that he ran out into the neighborhood behind my store. The other guy is this a uh, kind of a large gentleman um, wearing some actually really nice jeans, white tennis shoes, and uh, a red uh, a red sweater, just real nice actually. Comes walking in the door, just kind of bebops down the down the aisle, and gets down to our liquor cabinet, our, our beer cooler rather, and turns around. And he just for all he could just starts running as fast as he could for all that was. Um, and grabs a 12-pack bottle of beer that we had a, a display of in the middle of the floor. Runs for the door, boom, hits the door. Um, gets a mouthful of door. What do I do? Because I was kind of a mouthy young punk with no direction, had no idea. Um, hey, there's a, t there's a time to run your mouth and a time not to run your mouth. I'm like, hey, fat boy. He takes off running out the, the door that was unlocked. I hop over the counter and take off running after him. Um, trying to hold the puke back from coming out of my mouth. Run out the door and I'm running down the sidewalk because he can't run very fast. I catch up to him pretty quick. And all I'm going to do is I'm just going to, I'm going to yank the beer out of his hand and, and uh, I figured he'd just take off running. Well, he sees me coming, tries to run the beer at me. 
squares off with him. He starts calling me names and all that other good stuff. I thought, okay, let's do this and uh, square off with him. He reaches uh, in his belt line, pulls out what the other guy gave to him before he came in. Before he came in, uh, pulls his knife out, opens it up, and starts walking towards me. And I'm like, okay, I'm out. Uh, I'm unarmed. Um, I couldn't bleed like everybody else. He takes off running. Uh, I'm going. Tell my manager we call the police and make a report and all that good stuff. They didn't get away with the beer. So as the, the officers are sitting there taking the report, um, I'm like, man, this just seems like it's really interesting. I want to do more of this. I want to know more about this. So I schedule a ride along. And that was kind of cool. Um, that ride along, we got into a pursuit in the first 30 minutes um, after I got in the car. Um, arrested the guy, he was drunk, learned how that whole DWI situation works out. Um, and then we uh, go and uh, get some dope information, go work some dope uh, over by the college. Um, turned out to be a pretty fruitful night. So I'm like, well, maybe there's something to this. My brother's like, I told you so. Um, you need to go apply at this jail. And so uh, I did. Uh, January 1 of 98, I applied actually, or January 2, I'm sorry. Um, first available day in January of 98, I could. So I do that, and it took me about four months uh, to go through the application process uh, just because they didn't have any available openings, and I get hired on April 1 of 98. Worked to jail for six years. Um, in that time, I went to the police academy. Um, and uh, after working the jail, or after I graduated the academy, I worked uh, another three months in the jail, and I moved on to the transportation division where I hauled prisoners back and forth uh, from court, other jails, and prisons, and other facilities, doctors, appointments, and whatnot. Did that for about three months, and then went on to the streets, uh, where I really just uh, kind of dove into the whole lifestyle. So that's where I come from. I uh, got to work the detectives division for a little while, uh, did some really cool stuff there, uh, worked SWAT team, uh, worked, uh, being, I wanted to join SWAT because I wanted to be on sniper team. I made sniper team and loved every minute of it. Uh, while I was on SWAT, we got to uh, do some really cool stuff with the Department of Defense uh, and do some really cool training exercises and stuff like that. Um, I got to uh, be a part of a, a U.S. Marshals Task Force where we hunted down sex offenders just to check their compliance. Um, had some, uh, just some good cases that came out of that as well. Uh, so anyway, I have a little bit of a history. Um, I worked the dope. Uh, I used to serve a lot of warrants, um, stuff like that. So uh, I got a pretty good, well-rounded history of, of the law enforcement life and, and how that uh, and how that plays out. So some of the best memories of my life were with some really great people and some knowledgeable people uh, that I learned a lot from and and, and hopefully um, that I got to pass all that knowledge because I did the, uh, the FTO thing where I trained the new guys coming out uh, for quite a while and uh, just a really good experience there as well. I got to teach in the police academy under one of my instructors um, that, I, that I learned under. Um, I taught in the combatives program, uh, defensive tactics and whatnot, and I taught alongside my martial arts instructor, uh, which was a real honor. Um, uh, I was uh, I was approached about doing that job, and uh, it's not something I ever set out to do, uh, but considered a real honor um, because it's just almost unheard of. And so I got to do that for a few years, and so I just uh, I really I really have a high regard and a high respect for. Uh, for law enforcement, those who teach and, and, and bring the new guys up and, gal, and gals, rather, uh, just because I think it's important. We've got to have those mentors there. Uh, we've got to have the people that have been there and done that uh, leading these new folks in. So just like they took me under their wing, um, I think it's important that we take the new people coming up uh, under our wing as well. But uh, So I guess I still get to teach class and, and everything else, uh, which is kind of cool. Um, get to meet a lot of the new young up and comings and just kind of look forward to see where they're going to go in their careers as well. So, but anyway, let's get back on point. So I want to read from my notes again here, wherever the men and women, 
whoever the women, men and women who put on the uniform come from, wherever they come from, they're all, they all have one similar characteristic. They not only know about the dangers of society, but they're also willing to hunt those down um, and address those dangers every day. Uh, it's a mindset, guys. Um, it's, it's almost been cliche now over the last couple of years. You know, we, we run towards the danger, and we really do. Um, it's not that we're not afraid, uh, because sometimes, to be honest with you, we are. Um, but we know that it needs to be addressed, and something's got to be done about it. And we're willing to step up, even uh, put ourselves uh, in danger to be able to address those and, and take care of the, of the innocents and defend the innocents and defend the laws of the states and the Constitution. So, um, but they know they may not be the most favored type of people in, in, in the world, and we get it. There are a lot of people who misunderstand uh, what police do, and they don't like it. Um, but there's a need for it, and so we're willing to uh, take that on as well. I think I think if people had a really kind of a better understanding of, of what law enforcement is about, we'd have a whole different um, attitude from society and people more willing to step up and understand, maybe even get into the profession themselves and make the change that they see uh, that is needed, but learn about the process and why we do it and make some of the processes processes that we do better. So there's nothing wrong with that. If, if we, here's the thing, if any of us think that we've ever got it down in this world, that we've got everything figured out, um, then it's time to move on and do something else. And none of us, uh, none of us do. We can always make our, our, our processes better. And that's every job, every profession. So, um, so yeah. Uh, anyway, more of my notes here. It says uh, officers know there's a vast uh, there's a vast part of society that has a distorted or narrow view of what they do, and oftentimes political odds are stacked against them, um, and, and or their agencies, which is so true. The political climate in this world is horrible, guys. Um, the media has not done us any favors. Um, the media has. Um, has a distorted view of what law enforcement is and the way they word things really kind of twists um, twists a situation um, just in the way they just in the way they talk about it so uh, the way they word it it could be very misleading um, so but there's also some good media that's put out about us um, and some of the things that we do uh, I've been on both sides of that fence and, and I can tell you right now um, the media has a huge effect on, on how people view law enforcement. And so that's why we strongly encourage people to just get out there and, and do it themselves and go do some ride-alongs and spend some time talking with officers and, and stuff like that. Um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of break off from this little rabbit trail. These people that are walking around with the video cameras walking up on officers and and making demands of, you got to show me your ID or I, I get to look in your car and stuff like that. Yeah, that that's, I'll be honest with you, that's a real good way of, of drawing some attention to you. Um, first of all, we don't have to identify ourselves to anybody when they walk up to us. And there's no state law that mandates that. Um, there might be an agency policy, and if, that, if that's the case, and those officers are, are more than happy to follow that policy. But just because somebody walks up and says, well, my tax dollars pay for this car or pay for that uniform or pay your salary, yeah, I pay taxes too. <laughs> so bless your hearts. Um, uh, my taxes pay for that car as well. Um, and it's still private property of the city so or of the agency and, and whatnot. So people don't just get to walk up and just get start digging through a patrol car and, and making all these demands of officers. And this business of, uh, of walking up on traffic stops and, and filming, if you want to film, that's fine. There's no, in my state anyway, um, there are no laws saying that people can't film, but you don't get to walk right, in the, right up in the middle of a, of a traffic stop or an investigation period. Um, that's, called a, that's a criminal charge called interfering with a police investigation. So um, state statutes, you don't get to do that. Um, it's all public information, and that's fine, and, and it re it's released to the public after the investigation is closed. Um, just because you have a certain feeling or you, you think whatever doesn't mean you get to go interfere with what they're doing and their responsibilities. So um, I'd really like to see that nonsense cut out. Um, there's a whole big misunderstanding there that could really kind of get some people in trouble. Um, and there's no need for it. Um, just sit back, go educate yourself on a ride along uh, or two, um, and go be part of a, a citizen's academy, which is very beneficial. 
gives you some really good inside knowledge of investigation process of uh, police procedures and, and agency policy and stuff like that. So, by the way, I apologize if I, if I talk funny. I've got these braces in here. I just got in here not too long ago. And I sound like I'm a little inebriated, but I'm not. Um, it just makes me talk funny. So, I apologize for that. But, back to my notes. Um, police believe in due process and will defend it at all costs. Uh, we're not judge and jury and executioner. We're not. Um, Regardless of what anybody says, these these uh, folks on Cop Blocker and, and similar sites and whatnot, that's not what we do, and that's not what we want to do. Uh, believe me, we don't want to be there any more than anybody else. Um, but that's the job we chose, and we and we do it because we believe in it. Certain cases that we that we work, that uh, we just honestly we don't want to be there, but we that's what we signed up to do, and so we're gonna we're gonna follow through with that. It's not that we're judging anybody. We don't think we're better than anybody else. We don't have anything over anybody else, but we do have authorities set in by uh, by the state, per the state, uh, to do our job. So, and, and we're gonna do them. So, so just let us do what we need to do and learn about the process along the way. Come ride with us and 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 uh, try it out sometime. So, I think you'll be enlightened, and I think you would uh, have just a, a, maybe a paradigm shift. Uh, of what it is so but officers understand the risk and dangers associated with the job and are willing to step up and do the task we've, we've already talked about that these are the ones that know they may not make it home uh, to their families uh, when they walk out the door and that's so true you know bright sunshiny day temperatures perfect at 72 degrees outside and you think oh this is going to be a wonderful day um, and before you can get your computer logged on in your patrol car you're being sent to a hot call and um, those situations arise more than what people think they do um, where they're sent to a call and uh, very dangerous uh, situations um, where they've got to defend somebody else or they've got to defend themselves or they are trying to save somebody from uh, a fire or a traffic stop where uh, or, or from a, I'm sorry, a, a, a traffic accident where car's about to slide off, been there and done that, car's about to slide off of, of a hill or, or, and somebody's trapped inside or the car may be catching on fire or you've got a call for the jaws of life and all of a sudden you're trying to pull a person out and you get caught up in there because your gear gets hung up or whatever. We understand those risks, uh, but we're willing to step up and do it. Again, we don't think we're tougher than anybody else. We don't think that we're cool or anything like that. Um, well, some might. I don't know. But um, but we understand there has to be those people that do that. And that's that's what we signed up to do. So, um, And we're willing to do it. So I think society needs uh, those type of people, just like the people that sign up and do the military. Uh, we need those folks. They do a job that, honestly, we just, uh, that our nation uh, is dependent upon. And so, just uh, keep that in mind. Uh, there, are, there are certain people with these certain mindsets that understand that. Not that anybody else doesn't understand it. It's not trying to take any away from any, anything away from anyone. But we get it. Um, and and we, we get that there are those people that are, that are needed. And we've, you know, we've got that mindset, so why not? Um, why not take that in consideration and go do it? So, um, anyway, these are the ones that know they may not make it home to their families as they walk out the door. Uh, this understanding is what shapes uh, their worldview. And so, we understand that, uh, we understand that every society um, needs those people. So, um, they really kind of, shape how we view the world and everything else. We understand that there are associated risk in, in, in everything that we do um, in every type of setting uh, from from inside buildings and restaurants and, and schools and office spaces and inside McDonald's, Burger King, whatever. We get it. And so we're there to, uh, to address anything that might happen uh, because we understand that Critical incidents happen inside all those places and all those settings. So the view is not that everyone is bad or is up to something. We don't, say, you know, we don't think that everybody's guilty of anything, but we watch people closely. Um, 
you know, and I know there are a lot of people who uh, outside of law enforcement and outside the military do the same thing. Um, but you know, I can, I can tell you right now, not just me, but so many other people like me, um, we, uh, every time somebody comes around, I'm always looking at their ankles, their sides, uh, any place that a weapon could be, could be hidden. Um, their, their belt line, uh, front and back and stuff like that. Just, I'm, I'm looking for, for weapons just in case they decide to go rogue because uh, somebody's going to have to address that if they do. Um, it's not that I think anybody's guilty of anything. Um, it's just based off of, off of what we have experienced in law enforcement and our training. Um, we're just preparing for, for what could happen. So, um, so yeah, it's uh, we we get not everybody's up, not everybody's bad people. There's probably more good people in the world than there are bad people. We get and we understand that, and I, I wholeheartedly believe that. Um, we just got to be ready to to defend the good uh, against the bad. So anyway, it's more something along the lines of way uh, of always looking out for for. What's wrong, uh, unjust, evil, dangerous, or deceiving. We just kind of covered that. They see things and respond to them, understanding the realities uh, a little better uh, each time, uh, which creates a sense of hyper-awareness. And that's true. Uh, the, more, the more you do something, the, the more you understand it, and the more you learn how to react to it appropriately. Um, you know, it's kind of it's like muscle memory or practice makes perfect, however you want to put it. Um, it's, it goes right along with that. And so... Um, we're a little bit more prepared each time, so uh, and, and that's a good thing, uh, just in, in anything else that we do in this world. They oftentimes are cynical, uh, even to the good of society, because they deal day in and day out with the worst and the best of everything in, in everything in between. So, uh, yeah, you, you kind of get uh, you kind of get uh, worn a little bit and calloused a little bit because you because of all the negativity you deal with. And the negativity comes from uh, just attitudes from other people as well. Um, just a, a, a misconception from society who puts it out in, in the form of videos or flipping you off while you're driving down the highway or, or uh, yelling something at you while you're, um, while you're just inside trying to get a, get a drink of water uh, or trying to grab a bottle of water or, or, a, or a Coke or something like that at a gas station. Um, but also from mostly because of how people treat you on calls and the things you've got to deal with, you know, when you, when you're going to a domestic and all of a sudden you're going to arrest one party, uh, the abusive party and the other one attacks you or, or something like that. Um, you get a little bit, you, you do become cynical, uh, or you get enough people lying to you, you begin to understand that, Hey, people lie to you uh, people lie to the police and I'm just trying to take the dope out of the house away from the kids or whatever um, and they're doing everything they can to uh, to get out of it um, so yeah it's a uh, you do become a little bit cynical uh, but you learn you really kind of learn how to how to talk to people and read people and read situations uh, the more you're, you're in you're in those uh, the more you're in those settings so shock and all lessons with each call they respond to uh, which is good and bad. More, more on that in a later podcast. Yeah, so we'll talk about that later on a little bit more. So after you deal with things, like I said, you kind of become calloused. Um, and a lot of times you don't even realize it. Uh, the more you deal with uh, knuckleheads and people lying to you and stuff like that, that cynicism builds up. And... Think about it. If you were, if you were uh, lied to every day, or people uh, try to come after you in some way, shape, or form, um, just for doing your job, just for doing what you do. Um, and, but you see all these uh, different types of situations. You know the shock and all part of it, um, where most people would just uh, would would flip out over some of the stuff that we see and do, which is uh, a totally natural reaction uh, to a lot of those things. Um, the more you see it, the, the less reactive you are to it, which is a good thing in a sense that you've got to be able to maintain composure. You've got to be able to work the scene. You've got to be able to talk to people. You've got to be able to uh, 
um, photograph a scene that, that uh, honestly is just not uh, the best situation, but we have to have that. We have to be able to maintain ourselves so we can do good work and, and get to the end result uh, of, uh, of what needs to happen um, and do it accurately and do it uh, responsibly and professionally. So in a way that the public um, deserves and expects. So, um, but it's also bad in the sense that it does over time affect you um, and you don't realize it until later on. Uh, and when you do re realize it's a good thing, it's just it's just that build up to that point um, sometimes has uh, has more negative effects on on you physically, spiritually, mentally, um, and everything else. So uh, you know, if we're not affected by anything that we do in this world, that, then that's a problem. There's something wrong with us. And so um, I do know that uh, officers they're they're affected by it. You know. Uh, and I can go on to a lot of stories, and that's that's something for a later discussion. But um, but just understand that, that is a, that's a real effect. Um, because of these things, arrogance is a perceived characteristic of law enforcement officers, and so that's true. Um, you know, it's uh, it's not something that it's not something that's intended, but just the buildup of everything uh, when you get enough people who don't understand, and then you, you start receiving criticism. Um, they misunderstand what's going on. Uh, I've had folks in the past that uh, got upset because they they waved at me, and I, I didn't wave back. I just kind of stood there, had my sunglasses on and everything else. But they didn't understand that I wasn't looking at them. <laughs> they couldn't see my eyes through my sunglasses, and so I was looking at something else uh, beyond them or across the street or, or in a different direction. So, um, so yeah. Uh, I think the things we do can be uh, gravely misunderstood uh, as arrogance and as uh, as conceit, and it's, it's just not that's just not the way it is. So, um, back to my notes. I said the flip side to this is the is the fact that in the cop culture is that the experienced officers go through do cause a lot of officers to act or become arrogant. And that was kind of what I'm talking about, uh, and we'll talk about that more later on. Um, it's it's really important that people understand, society understands that that's not our intention. Uh, you know, I think when I became aware of it, um, I started intentionally trying to uh, address people different, just in general public, laugh with them a little bit more, um, talk to them a little bit more, share some of my own personal experiences and, and things that I, you know, things that I'm doing in, in, in just in daily life. Uh, just to uh, show more of that human side. Uh, we're not robots, um, although we, you know you feel like it at times. It's just day in and day out. It's kind of like the old. It's kind of like the uh, the person that deals with uh, that works sits in the office and deals with people coming up to the booth every day. You know, they're just sitting there, just yes, yes. But they're not even looking at them in the eye. Take a number. Um, Nothing against anybody who who works in these type of places, but you know, think of the folks that uh, work in like the license bureau, the DMV. Uh, they deal with everybody day in and day out. Some are happy, some are not happy, and stuff like that. You know, you're there spending money, doing things that uh, some people honestly don't think they should have to do, or trying to get paperwork that they've uh, they've been trying to get for for months or weeks or whatever, and and they are just tired of being there. And they give a little bit of attitude to the person behind the desk. Uh, the person behind the desk is, you know, they deal with that on a daily basis, and they're just kind of tired of it. They don't even look at you in the eyes sometimes, um, and giving you that respect. That's just human respect, and that's something that everybody wants. And so, officers are, are very similar. Um, so yeah, uh, we understand that. That's not our intention. Um, um, so please, you know, just take that into consideration, and and just understand where they're coming from as well it's uh for those of us who understand it and start to try to uh, advert that uh, through our own actions and whatnot um give those guys some grace <laughs> give give everybody some grace it just uh you know we we all come from different backgrounds and deal with different things on a daily basis so um and, you know, and yes we understand that officers should do the same with other people we get people who go through bad situations and they're frustrated and worked up and whatnot but we all need to come to a common ground just to be able to talk to each other. So, 
My notes, more notes says agencies nowadays require multiple hours of training in mental health, firearms, alcoholic, uh, alcoholic intoxication. I'm sorry, it's my braces. Drug intoxication, emergency driving, defensive tactics, public speaking, racial profiling, constitutional amendments, and the list goes on. Lots and lots and lots and lots of training. Um, states also mandate so many hours uh, of training, of updated training every year for every officer. It's so this this whole uh, this whole topic of that you see people talking about making comments on videos. It's the police lack of training. Uh, they didn't train this or they didn't train that. Um, well, my guess would be, uh, how do you know, Skippy? How do you, uh, what do you know about the police? What's your experience? Well, I know so-and-so who's a police officer. I'm related to so-and-so who's a police officer and they did this or they said that. Well, cool. But I can tell you right now, and I've heard it said multiple times over my, over my career, was that it's been said at the end of a 20-year career, uh, that officers have the equivalent to two master's degrees uh, of training. It's just something that's mandated all the time. My agency was, was uh, my, my agency administrator was very, very, very pro training. Uh, keep up on your hours. And, um, you know, we had a lot of instructors in-house uh, that went to a lot, of, uh, a lot of different schools to be able to bring that professional training to their, to their agency. Um, uh, which is just, it's, it's a good thing. With the things that we go through nowadays uh, in law enforcement, I'm sure 25, 30, 40 years ago, they were saying the exact same thing with the things we go through nowadays. Um, but with society changing, ever changing as it is, um, we've got to have training. Um, and so agencies and, and, and the states, respective states, they require so much training. Um, and it's a good thing. So we do train a lot. And, and a lot of different things, not just the topics I talked about, but it's several others as well. Um, and, you know, a lot of it's really interesting and a lot of it's really not, uh, but it is what it is. It's training. Um, and so, and we'll talk about where that, you know, in, in another time, in another video, we'll talk about where uh, that training comes in handy um, and where it helps um, because it's not, it's not for... Uh, it's not to be discarded, and it's not to be considered that uh, it's worthless or we, you know, not effective or anything like that. It's it's actually very effective. So, um, just understand that we do train a lot, and we're always pursuing trying to make ourselves better. Uh, again, if we think we've got it all down and we can answered all the questions in this world, then uh, and we've got it all figured, and it's time to move on and do something else. So, um, so yeah, there are, are a lot of instructorships, um, and specialty trainings that many officers go through. Um, I was fortunate enough in my career to be able to uh, become an instructor in a few different things. Uh, really enjoy it and uh, uh, have a lot of fun with it. You, you know, you gotta you gotta have an interest in it, um, and it will be really good at it and, and whatnot. You've got to live it, and you've got to uh, do it in your in every day of your career. So, um, or train it, or uh, or help out in some way, shape, or form. Be there, be there for others who, uh, uh, who are just trying to learn as well. So, and then back it up with with uh, facts and law, uh, laws and statutes and whatnot. And and most importantly, the Constitution. Um, the Constitution is huge to law enforcement officers. So, um, contrary to what you see in in videos that contain less than one percent of officers and agencies, um, uh, ninety nine point nine percent of officers are. Uh, they back the Constitution. They think it's uh, the forefront of our nation. So uh, we believe in everybody's rights and whatnot. But and we'll we'll talk about that later on as well. Um, officers do this or they do that, and it violates this right or that right. Um, so there are Supreme Court decisions that have been made over the years um, that allow officers to do what they do. Um, that is that is not. Uh, up to the officers, that is up to the Supreme Courts, and so the argument really isn't with those in uniform or the agencies, um, but it would be with the higher courts who make those decisions. So we'll talk about that more later on as well. Um, the training combined with real life experience in jails on the streets creates extraordinary confidence in the police officers. Um, and they they grow a confidence within themselves and can play part uh, and their can play a part in their cynicism. Uh, because of their knowledge and their abilities uh, that's enhanced and they have a deeper sense of awareness. 
like everything else, the more we do something, the more confidence we build up in ourselves. Um, and so, um, you know, human beings in general, uh, we think we have a little bit better understanding and, and, and uh, over people uh, just in different situations. And because of training and experience, we do. Uh, but it doesn't mean we're better than anybody else. But um, most of us try to be aware of that. I can tell you that right now. Um, it's it's an honor to be able to do a lot of things that we do, to be able uh, to do a lot of what general society just doesn't do. Um, and other people in other professions can, in other professions can say the same thing. Um, it's just something that's very important um, to us. It's how we make ourselves better at what we do. And uh, there's, I, I think that's a great thing. So, excuse me. The other side of the cop culture is the way we dress. Uh, so let me see, where do we start here? Um, start with our hair. My hair is about five times longer than what it was when I worked the streets. I always shaved my head. There are reasons for that. Um, I guess I've been in enough uh, situations where my hair got pulled and whatnot. Um, um, now that I'm out of full-time law enforcement, um, I decided to grow my hair out a little bit more. Um, my wife prefers it long. Um, so trying to keep her happy. Uh, she likes it. I'm actually kind of 50 50 about it but most of us wear our hair short um usually trimmed or tapered um some guys and gals wear product in their hair um me uh, honestly i have to wear product in my hair because it goes this way that way that way and that way all at the same time so um that's just part of the cop culture uh, a lot of folks are trying to bring style into the uniform and stuff like that um Whatever, you know, as long as you do your job and you do it good, that's, that's I guess that's really all that matters. Um, I was never the guy that sprayed myself down with cologne and, and made myself look like Hollywood uh, as I'm coming out, but teach your own. Um, let's see. Tradition professionalism, agency policy. Um, some agencies have policies that, uh, you know, you have to have trimmed hair, short hair, groomed hair, whatever. Um which I, you know, it's, it makes the uniform look good, and I think it's great. So, um, uh, nothing wrong with that. I'm kind of old school in my thinking. You know, you're, you're there to represent, and you're a professional. So, uh, let's do that. Female officers with long hair um, most times keep their hair pulled back. Um, yeah, I think that's probably a good idea. Um, some gals don't, and, and you know, that's that's fine. It's up to them. But, um, you know, I think I think it's a you know, we got to make ourselves um, ready to do the job and don't put ourselves in situations that from the way we carry our gear and the way we the way we dress and stuff like that. Don't put ourselves in situations that are going to, guys included, uh, keep your hair pulled back if it's long um, because you don't want to get pulled or snag or, or, or anything like that. So, uh, and I've seen, I've seen that as well. So, um, male or female officers will usually... Uh, keep their hair uh, with a couple of different styles and stick with it. Uh, this is their comfort zone and almost their sense of identity, which, yeah, it is. I mean, um, my sense of identity was the way I dressed and the way I, and the way I presented myself. You, and I've had so many people tell me, uh, you look like a cop. That's not my intention. That's just kind of who I became and stuff like that because uh, I took my job seriously. Not that you can't take it seriously. I'm not trying to say that. But uh, that's just something that, that, that I did, um, and I know a lot of other guys do, so, uh, and a lot of other gals. So that's, that's great. Um, Off-duty is a little bit tricky. Um, when you're talking about the uh, change of the times and stuff like that, um, there are still some officers in the, uh, from back in the day that uh, s still hold to some form of the, of the fashion of their time. So um, <laughs> let's talk about that. Uh, officers of the, of the day and you're starting to see a little bit more uh, nowadays with officers with the uh, kind of big hair and big thick mustaches and, and stuff like that uh, cool that, that never was my thing but you know but you still knew who they were back in the day um, so you know there are, that's part of our culture as well um, of the cop culture so um, we still look like off duty, we still look like cops, uh, either old school or new school. We still do, uh, and you can usually tell. 
Uh, the way we dress is usually a, uh, a plain colored polo uh, and or khaki pants, or, or with khaki pants rather, or shorts, uh, usually tan or brown, uh, and black are the color of choice. Um, so yeah, uh, we, you know who we are right off the bat. You, you can spot us a mile away. And um, personally, I think uh, for those who, who don't match that, uh, that typical look, um, that's not saying anything bad uh, either way about it, uh, but the more you can stay away from that look uh, and don't uh, label yourself and put yourself out there, I think that just keeps us safe. Um, because if you're out in public and somebody comes in and decides they want to do some nonsense, um, you want to be set apart because yeah, if, if that person sees you when they walk in, um, they know right where to go. So, uh, so yeah, I, I guess I'm kind of mixed on my, on my feelings towards that. Um, you want to be who you are. Um, but sometimes, uh, you gotta, you gotta set yourself apart. Um, so, but whatever their dress code is, uh, they'll always make it to where they can carry a full-size Glock or, or their off-duty weapon of some sort or the smallest concealable firearm that they can find. So um, in today's world, yeah, um, I can tell you right now that that's, that's something that I, that I did and still do. It's, it's uh, very important because uh, you know, it's hard to be able to walk into McDonald's and, uh, and, and not see something that needs to be addressed anymore. And, and, and unfortunately, it's like that. Uh, but you always got to be prepared for danger. Um, and so, uh, and be willing to address that on duty or off duty. So, um, so yeah, anyway, moving on. No matter where they are, those in the cock culture will always maintain a degree of preparedness. Uh, we just talked about that. Um, and I'm not going to get into all the stuff that we do carry, um, on duty, off duty, or whatever. Some off duties, uh, may even sport their agency's logo on a hat or a hoodie. Um, I hope not. Um, it's almost putting a big sign on yourself saying, hey, look at me. Um, so, but there are those guys and gals that do that stuff. So um, officers within the cop culture will always have each other's back, uh, which is true. Not just, uh, not just victims, um, not just innocents, but we, you know, we have each other's back. Uh, you know, we don't, uh, there is no, um, there may be in some areas, I don't know, but this, this whole idea of, uh, there, there is, you know, I'm going to, I'm always going to support law enforcement. I'm always going to have their backs and stuff like that. Uh, but if they're in the wrong, I'm going to, I'm going to be, uh, I'll be the first right there to, to say it too and talk about that as well. So, um, and address that. So, uh, but we will have each other's back no matter if we're on duty, off duty, always there to help, always willing to pull over on traffic stop if I see uh, somebody needing some help. Um, uh, of course, I'm going to identify myself because I don't want to. I don't want to get myself uh, in any kind of a bad situation. So, um, but they, they may be complete strangers that haven't had the chance to work with one another or can't uh, stand to be around each other because of personality conflicts, which does happen. Uh, but we will always have each other's back, guys. Um, so, rest assured, they will come together in the most in the moment of emergency and when things go down. So yeah, um, at the end of the day, we can all accomplish our goals together despite personality conflicts. And, and everybody has personality conflicts in every profession and everything else. Um, and, that, and that's fine. Uh, nothing wrong with that uh, as long as it makes you grow into a better person. Um, but yeah, uh, at the end of the day, we all have the same goals in mind and that's what we're trying to accomplish. So yeah, um, in those in those situations, they're going to lay their differences aside and take care of business, and you know it. it very good chance that it'll bring those those two close together. So, um, whatever the dynamic, an officer social group is, uh, will usually be closed and comprised of only other cops, which is very true. Um, me personally, I made it a point I didn't want to hang out with other law enforcement. Um, I guess as time went on and I got more mature in my career just because I needed that break. I wanted that break. Um, you know, there's a, there's enough, uh, there was enough, uh, it was mostly men that worked in my, that work at my agency. Um, we have some women that, that work in there that, uh, that were doing, uh, 
right the other the work right there along with us but uh, uh and a lot of them would hang out with uh, uh with each other and and the guys as well um i just didn't want to hang out with anybody that i worked with not because i didn't like them or anything like that it's just i needed a break and so that can be construed within within the walls of your agency as as arrogance too um that's not what it was i just i just I wanted that break to be me, uh, to be a husband to my wife, and to be uh, a dad to my kid, my kids. So, um, so yeah, uh, I, I hung out with people who were non-law enforcement, and, and really kind of still do. I, uh, now that I'm not in it full time, I, I hang out with uh, other cops sometimes, uh, go to pool parties and, and stuff like that. But uh, for the most part, most of my my group is a non-law enforcement. So. Um, but there may be some non-law enforcement cops in their circle, uh, but it's limited uh, for most people. That, that is true. Um, this is because they want to be around people who understand them and have, uh, have the same mindset as them. Um, it's not that they think they're better than anybody else. They just um, they want to be around people who get it. And we, you know, we'll, we'll discuss that a little bit more later on, too. They also want to be around people who understand things the way they do and who get what they mean. Uh, when they when they need to vent, yeah, um, or who have had the same feelings uh, about something they've experienced, or have similar experiences and know where they're coming from. So yeah, um, I think we're all like that as human beings. So the music we listen to, let's talk about that for a minute. Um, it's just about anything. So cops have a wide uh, selection, like everybody else, uh, music they prefer. Um, Rap, rock, screamo, uh, ska. I had a supervisor who listened to classical music, piano music all the time, Mozart and stuff like that. Um, and there's a reason why he did it, but that's what he preferred. Um, and that's totally cool. We listen to it all. We are just like everybody else in this world. Um, country music, um, reggae music. Had uh, one friend that listened to reggae all the time. Um, uh, so yeah, we, we listen to it all. Um, and we... Can somehow or another incorporate it into our into our uh, little subculture that we have and, and, and make it uh, make it all come together so uh, we dance um, <laughs> dance on coals uh, when it you know when it's appropriate um, sometimes it's just to uh, get the attention of of, uh, of those we're uh, working with try to get kids to uh, uh, relax and, and see that we're, we're you know we're just people um, which is really kind of cool uh, when you get to, and, and even with the adults and stuff like that, when you get to make that connection with people, um, it's, it's really kind of a cool experience. But we dance, um, most of the time it's around only other cops and probably at the station or maybe by, uh, in, a, in a parking lot somewhere where there's nobody else around. Um, and some of, the, some of the folks that even go to the uh, clubs off duty and stuff like that, they dance there too. So, um, some can dance real good, some can do it in uniform, um, more power to them. I was never one of those guys that could do it in uniform very well. So, uh, several of us have a really good musical talent and a background, I like to show it off, um, especially the other cops. Uh, I have a musical background, I've played professionally for several years, and uh, um, a lot of cops have a lot of other talents, um, and they're really good at it. So, uh, music was mine, and, and it is for a lot of, for a lot of folks. Uh, I met a lot of other cops that could sing like uh, like nobody's business and uh, had great voices and stuff like that. So uh, really good public speaking, by the way, uh, especially when they're on calls. Family and friends. Like everybody else, else in the world, family and friends are their most prized possession. Um, this is who they play with, talk to, and confide in, and trust. Um, look forward to seeing at the at every opportunity. Yeah, uh, so true. Um, uh, the, it, their families are their escape at, at the end of their shift uh, and long days of working. So, yeah, you know, like anybody else in the world. Um, cops in their off-duty time, they coach games, uh, take spouses out to dinner, have family emergencies and go to the lake and, and mow the yards like anybody else. Um, we do it all like everybody else. You know, it, it's just living life. Uh, this law enforcement thing is just a, it's, it's a job that we do. Um, but unfortunately, schedules uh, that we work will oftentimes keep us apart uh, from our families uh, because of a midnight shift, training, 
shift meetings uh, being called in or days off, a call or report that carries over into the next shift, uh, and, it, and being called out to court. So whatever the reason, uh, these factors also have a tendency to drive marriages and relationships apart, uh, which is so true, like every other profession in the world. Um, it's unfortunate. So I was, I'm, I've been fortunate enough to not have to go through that. Um, uh, I'm, my wife met me when I was in, in the profession, and uh, she was non-law enforcement. Um, she, did, she didn't hang around law enforcement or anything like that, but we met, and uh, you know, here we are all these years later. Uh, and so it's, uh, I, I was pretty fortunate in that, uh, you know, not to say that we haven't had our hard times, but uh, uh, work was never uh, a, a reason for those hard times. So uh, be that as it may, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's not the case for everybody. So um, it's never the intention of being uh, in the beginning, really, uh, ever. Uh, but not all police officers' relationships fall uh, and not all officers' relationships fall prey to, to separate, and so like I just talked about. And I know several other uh, uh, officers whose marriages are, are great, uh, been married way longer than I have, and uh, just going strong. So um, the ones that decide to call it quits are the result of time spent, uh, uh, or one spends apart from, their, from each other. So, you know, it's, it's like any other marriage in the world. The more time you spend away from your, from your spouse uh, or significant other, um, the more opportunity you have to, to venture away from that. And so uh, we are human. We go through that as well, just like everybody else, and it, it affects us in the exact same ways. So, um, you know, we're human beings. Uh, we are what we are. So... A time away is often at times a, a choice that an officer makes uh, on their own because they didn't know how to talk. So yeah, let's. A lot of times we don't know how to talk to our spouses, our significant others, uh, about some of the things that we do, and so the best thing to do in our own minds sometimes is just to avoid it. And avoiding means uh, spending time away. Uh, that's it's unfortunate, but it's the truth. And so. That, that drives a wedge in between uh, in, in the middle of your relationship and it can also oftentimes cause problems. So that's, uh, it's, it's sad but true. Um, I've seen it happen to a lot of folks a lot, uh, a lot of times. Uh, unfortunately, I've seen it happen to um, individuals multiple times for one, for one individual and I, and I don't get it. Um, so, it's just, it's just one of those realities that we deal with. Um, the other side that, that's cliche is that there's oftentimes uh, officers that have long fulfilling marriages and relationships because they and their other half knew the possibilities they decided they wanted better for their lives. And, I'm sorry, I'm reading my notes here. Um, yeah, we know the we know the challenges when we go into uh, relationships, and we want to we wish, we, we make it a point. Um, that's not saying we're better than anybody else for for anybody who has a long lasting marriage. Um, it takes work uh, with anything. It takes work. Um, but regardless of all this, being a spouse of a police officer is hard uh, for a lot of reasons. Um, the kind of calls that we can the work the kind of calls that we work the the long hours we work. Things we see, things we do, and, and stuff like that. Um, our spouses, they, they go through a lot. Um, sometimes they feel like single parents raising kids on their own and, and, and living their own lives and stuff like that. And so we just, you know, we try to be cognizant of that and, uh, and everything else. And we, you know, so it's balance is, is essential in our lives, just like everybody else's life. So uh, really important. Let's move on here. Uh, Let's see. An ending here. Is, I have it subtitled "Ending." So, if your time here today shed a little bit of light on what's commonly referred to as the cop culture, um, it's a real thing. Just as there are many other subcultures in our society, but also understand that to a degree there is a need for the cop culture. There's a need for those types of people, um, just like we talked about at the beginning of all this. Um, we've got to have people with that mindset. 
Um, it is what binds us together in the, in, in the profession. Um, but just as it binds us together, it also allows us, uh, those of us in the cop culture, to recognize the posers. <laughs> Let's talk about that for a second. Uh, and, and try to get them excused uh, to keep from being uh, those that taint the good oil. So, um, and that's exactly how I put it in my notes. Um, we know there are those people who want to be police officers. And uh, there are some folks that have made it in the media over the years that uh, we could probably... Uh, talk about but I'm not going to that uh, that have ended up giving law enforcement a, a, a bad rap and a bad image and when I say taint the good oil um, we don't want them to uh, taint the image any more than they already have so we look for those people um, there's nothing wrong with being direct saying hey this isn't for you uh, but calling them out on the nonsense that they do um, people who pose as police officers and, and stuff like that. And, uh, yeah, there are those folks out there, just like there are people who pose as as a military and whatnot. Um, you know, we, we look for those people um, uh, uh, to try to draw attention to them so that they won't be doing it anymore. So, um, you know, there are things that they could probably be good at um, otherwise, and they need to go and, and, and do those things. Uh, stay away from uh, from a good, noble profession. So... Um, anyway, again, if you have any questions or comments or anything, email me at uh, whydothecops at gmail.com. Um, I'll note your questions and try to address them as much as I possibly can. Uh, maybe through a, a, I'm not sure how I'm going to do this podcast thing, but quarterly, um, weekly, uh, month, I'm not sure just yet. Um, but look me up on Facebook and, and send me some messages on Facebook. Uh, same thing with Twitter. Um, put in some hashtags give some uh, spread the word uh, trying to get this out there and uh, you know if you got something you want to you want to talk about or, or want to know about or whatever uh, shoot me a message and, we, and we'll uh, make it a point to uh, to get to it because I think it's important that people understand uh, what we do as law enforcement so anyway you can always use your support and and uh, you know support your local law enforcement uh, uh, city county state uh, federal folks and all that there's a you know there's a need for us out there so anyway i hope you enjoy the time and i'll check you out next time see ya